Hi, I'm Tim Behrens. I'm the deputy editor at eLife. Welcome. We just wanted to uh, run a seminar, uh, which is um, telling you about some of the cool new things we're doing at eLife generally, and allow you to ask um, some questions of our neuroscience uh, editors. Um, uh, so yeah, eLife e is um, uh, trying to change how publishing works. And so uh, we realize this is uh, a bit of a, um, a big step and a confusing step for you, uh, for, for our authors. And so, yeah, this is just kind of um, uh, an introduction to that. Um, uh, and so uh, we're lucky today to have um, some of our editors uh, with us. Should we advance to the next? Oh, uh, yeah, maybe, um, Maria, you can go through this slide about uh, the participation and uh, how it, oh, uh, or I can just read it. <laughs> okay. I, I, can, I can do that quickly uh, for you, Tim. So uh, in, in terms of a few participation guidelines, you can post your questions in the Zoom, the Zoom chat to the panelists. Uh, we will have a dedicated time at the end of the of the presentation for Q and A, and at that point, uh, we'll invite you to speak if you'd like, or we can read out the questions for you. Uh, we want everyone to enjoy this this meeting, so to ensure that all have a chance to contribute, all participants are asked to abide by eLife's code of conduct. So, just some examples of behaviour that we think contribute positively to our communities include showing empathy and kindness towards others, being respectful of differing opinions, uh, viewpoints and experiences, and some examples of an acceptable behavior that will not be tolerated today would be, for example, making it difficult for others to speak or participate, for example, through repeated interruptions or disruptions. Uh, so in the background, uh, we also have my colleague Anya Staris from the eLife staff. So if you need any technical support, please send a direct message to Anya. And for your reference, this webinar is being recorded. So uh, great. Thanks, to... Maria. Uh, perfect. Um, and so today uh, we're lucky to have with us, um, um, obviously uh, you're not lucky to have me, uh, but you're lucky to have uh, Floris and Juan uh, and Megan. Um, this is... Uh, um, uh, timed for the um, European and Asian markets. And so we've got a good selection of our European and uh, Asian uh, neuroscience editors. Uh, we've actually just um, had a big recruitment drive uh, in Asian uh, neuroscience editors because we realized um, that we are uh, quite European and American biased. And so we hope there'll be a big, um, uh, there'll be a, a much uh, larger Asian uh, community amongst our editors uh, um, and so we've had people accept recently from China, from Japan, uh, from Singapore, amongst many, uh, amongst others, a, a big, a big drive. Uh, so hopefully that'll um, uh, make uh, make it easier um, uh, to interact with us uh, from uh, from Asia. Uh, uh, so that's great. Um, uh, so Floris uh, is a cognitive, cognitive neuroscientist, uh, as is uh, Juan uh, and Meg Megan. I don't know. I guess you want to call yourself a systems neuroscientist interested in the cerebellum. Uh, fantastic. Uh, let's move on to the next slide, please. So, Tim, I wonder if we would like to also just invite Megan Flores and who wants oh, to say yeah. a little bit more about um, themselves. So, um, Megan, would you like to also just uh, say what your role at eLife is, uh, provide a brief summary of your research path, current scope of research, and the kinds of papers you usually handle for eLife, please? Sure. Um, hi, I'm Megan Carey. I'm a group leader in the Champalamo Neuroscience Program at the Center for the Unknown in Lisbon, Portugal. Um, I'm a reviewing editor at eLife, and my background is in uh, the neural control of movement as well as cellular physiology in the cerebellum. And in my lab, we're interested in uh, neural control of movement, specifically looking at learned and coordinated movements in mice, and we focus on cerebellar circuits. Um, so the kinds of papers I handle at eLife are, I handle a lot of cerebellum papers, papers on motor control, as well as behavioral analysis and computational ethology. That's something my lab has been very active in. Um, and I also handle um, some neural circuits papers for mouse neural circuit work more broadly. So outside of the cerebellum, basal ganglia and other circuits. Um, yeah, I'm a big fan of eLife and I've published a lot there myself. So looking forward to answering your questions. Is that, is that good, Maria? <laughs> Enough? It's perfect, thanks, Megan. <laughs> Juan, would you like to go next? 
Okay, so hi everyone. My name is Juan Luo, and I'm currently Associate Professor in School of Psychological and Cognitive Sciences at Peking University, Beijing, China. Uh, I'm a reviewing editor for eLife, and I have done this job for more than two years. Um, so uh, my, uh, my background is actually, I got my PhD from University of Maryland uh, under the supervision of uh, Professor David Popo and Jonathan Simon. So at that time, uh, my research interest is using EEG and MEG to try to understand the time-based, oscillation-based neural mechanism for speech processing, for auditory processing. And then when I came back to China, I first worked at Chinese Academy of Sciences. Now I'm at Peking University. My research interest began to widen, um, widen to some extent, especially to vision domain. So we use time-resolved approaches, still EEG, MEG, and also some behavior measurements uh, combined with computational modeling, trying to understand the temporal dynamics, temporal organization in many cognitive processes, such as visual attention, and working memory. Uh, yeah, that's, that's my uh, current research interest. Uh, the paper I handle in eLife, um, to my memory, I think it's wide range. So it covers auditory processing, speech processing, multisensory integration, uh, attention, and working memory. Um, sometimes I also handle some uh, uh, MEG technique paper, although I'm not an expert, but I'm yeah, I'm interested in you know the like more advanced ways to uh, either MEG modeling, uh, MEG source modeling, or data analysis. Yeah, I'm also a big fan of eLife, and yeah, we can uh, share more in the later session. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. And Floris? Hi, uh, yeah, so my name is Floris de Lange, and I'm full professor at Randboud University in Nijmegen in the Netherlands and principal investigator at the Donners Institute for Brain Cognition and Behavior. Uh, I'm a senior editor at eLife in the neuroscience section, and my main focus of research is the cognitive neuroscience of perception and decision making. So I'm interested in how top down states like prior beliefs and goals interact with incoming sensory information. And in my lab, we use non-invasive neuroimaging methods in humans, like fMRI and MEG, as well as behavior and computational modeling to answer questions in that field. And at eLife, I handle mostly papers studying humans, but also some looking at neural activity in other species, such as rodent, primates. And the papers that I see are mostly um, experimental papers. They uh, use an experimental manipulation, and they aim at better understanding the neurobiology of certain types of cognition of behavior. So they usually try to make a link between brain and behavior. Okay, and I'm looking forward to answering all your questions later. Thanks. Uh, great, thanks um, very much indeed. That gave me uh, some respite as well as introducing uh, our fabulous editors. Um, uh, so maybe we can move to the next slide now, uh, Maria. Yeah. So, uh, um, the, for the next 10 or 15, 10 minutes or so, I'm going to just try and tell you something new we're doing at eLife and hope to get you excited by it. Um, uh, but first, I'm just going to say eLife in general, it's raison d'etre. The reason we're here is uh, partly to publish fantastic science with all the decisions made by fantastic scientists, but also to provide big changes, new mechanisms for how science publishing can work. Uh, because we all know of all the problems and profiteering by the science publishing industry. And um, I'm not going to go into all those details of the problems, uh, but just, just to highlight a few things we've done in the past and a few problems that still obviously remain that we're trying to address now. Um, and so previously, for example, we've uh, been big advocates of increasing the transparency of peer review, publishing all the reviews of our accepted papers. We've introduced new mechanisms for, for review, which, um, which mean that uh, individual reviewers have less power um, and because the reviews are consultative, uh, the reviewers talk amongst each other and amongst the editors to make the quality of decision making better. And this is very popular amongst our authors. It leads to quick and clear decisions where the review team are unanimous. Uh, we've also been big um, uh, 
innovators in the sort of mechanisms of publishing in science. And so, for example, we've um, invested in executable research articles, which are amazing things where the code for an article is embedded in the article. So you can do things like change all the statistics and see if the results are, are hold, et cetera, embedded in the article. And we've been a massive advocate of open publishing and so open data, open access. So those are the kinds of issues that we've focused on before. But that leaves the bones of science publishing still as it were. The, the, the basic mechanism for how science publishing works hasn't been changed by eLife yet. Journals are still gatekeepers. Enormous effort is wasted in this gatekeeping, meaning, meaning that authors have to submit to many different journals before they get in, um, uh, which leads to years of wasted effort. This means that reviewers and editors have too much power. And it also means that when you use your papers to get grants and, and, and jobs, really what they look at is still the journal's name, however many, however many um, um, times they sign things saying that they won't look at the journal name. That's really what they look at because there's no other form of public evaluation. And so if we want to really get to the bottom of these inherent problems in the publishing world, we need something really radically different. Okay, cool. And so Eli is trying to imagine new ways of doing that. And here is what we're doing right now. And so if you, uh, Maria, move to the next slide, we've, we've got this extraordinary opportunity to do something right now because of what's happening in the rest of publishing outside of the journal architect, uh, outside of journals. This is what's happened to Bio Archive over the past five or six years. Like it's now publishing 4,000 articles a month, Bio Archive. It's like flooding the, the, the journal. The journal world is being, is, is a smaller and smaller part of the published literature and the, uh, and the unreviewed uh, uh, archive is a larger and larger part of it. And there's two ways that you can think about this. You can think about this as being a, a threat to journals or you can think about it as being an opportunity, an exciting thing for journals to handle. We have a whole new world of, of how science is shared. And the question is not what, the question is not, okay, how does it fit with the journals we've got already? The question is, how do we take the opportunity of this whole new world to make a new way of evaluating science? Well, that's as far as we see the question to be. And so uh, if you um, move on to the next slide, Maria, the way we see it, pretty much that means journals aren't publishers anymore. Papers are already published on BioArchive. We, the, the problem of publishing a paper is being solved by somebody who's not a journal anymore. And so what is the, what is the journal's job? The journal's job is to now to curate that vast literature to make sure the high quality science is most visible, the interesting science is most visible. So uh, what we're doing is we're trying to figure out how to curate how, what this new world of publishing is going to look like. So we want to work out how to optimize peer review. And we think this means creating a new type of manuscript, a preprint with evaluations attached to it that's published in, an, in a, in a preprint server or, or in whatever new mechanism you're thinking about, but which combines the peer reviews, the, uh, uh, the, the evaluations of the community alongside the manuscript uh, and then allows um, mechanisms for uh, interesting papers to be highlighted clearly and uh, attract the attention in the way that journals do now, which means that we need to develop a new infrastructure for doing this, and more importantly, a new culture for how this discourse around preprints is going to happen. Um, and so uh, many of the things that we're doing are about this, uh, th these two things, this, this infrastructure, uh, this, the pragmatics of how you write public reviews and, and, and how you um, put them with, with papers, and then also how we can do it responsibly and respect, uh, respectfully in a way that is useful to the key stakeholders, to the, to the granting agencies, to the, to, the, um, uh, to the newspapers, but also to the science community. 
Okay, thanks, Maria. Can we go on to the next one? So this is the kind of thing we're doing. Uh, we, I'm going to read you a few of these evaluation summaries, and but we're 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 um, our primary out. We're viewing our primary output now of the journal as. Um, as evaluations of preprints, we're trying to redirect our editorial skills to doing this really, really well. Um, and so we're writing things like this uh, on this paper. This is it says something like this is a great paper, uh, but it needs some more more statistical analyses to, to really prove its point. That kind of thing in the evaluation summary, so people know what we think roughly of the journal uh, of the paper, and then more detailed reviews are being attached to those. But those aren't the kind of reviews that you get um, that you get sent back. Uh, with all the nitty bitty details that you get sent back from from most journals, those are going to be we, we try to make those uh, reviews that are, highlight the key strengths and key weaknesses of the paper. Reviews that uh, are useful for the community reading the reviews, not just for are uh, not written uh, just for the authors. And so this is uh, trying to make this new thing, this evaluated preprint. Thanks, Maria. Um, yep. Yeah, uh, so, uh, so this is um, m m m more on what I've just been saying. Effectively, saying we are going to uh, be uh, only um, evaluate. We're turning our, our our the power of our editorial process towards evaluating preprints. This means that we're basically going to uh, only evaluate preprints. All papers we review we re-review will be preprinted um, before um, uh, actually very soon by by July uh, um, this year. Um, and uh, and we are going to be trying to make uh, we're going to be trying to make a new way of 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 curating these preprints. Cool. Uh, thanks, Maria. So of course we love all the things that we uh, were doing before. So we're gonna we're gonna uh, try to make sure. All of the um, we're going to try to make sure all of the benefits from the previous processes uh, are still there. So we're going to have keep our consultation amongst the reviewers, uh, keep um, uh, uh, these the limited revision requests and round of revision. Uh, but we're going to be adding to this um, uh, this we're going to be adding to uh, this this new system where we're making we're separating out what we what we um, what we publish. What the, the parts of the review that we make public, which are written for uh, for for the reader, uh, versus the parts that are about getting published in eLife, and I'll just tell you in, in a little bit uh, in more detail uh, in a couple of slides that we're still that we're still going to be um, making eLife decisions and publishing things in eLife as well as the um, uh, as the uh, online evaluations, but the decision part that's going to be about how do you get into eLife. Um, is separated from this public evaluation of the preprint. Um, and again, next slide, Maria. So uh, I think that, uh, yep, so I think that's um, roughly what I've been saying. Um, uh, yep, so you're, you're going to end up with um, a, a, uh, an evaluated preprint uh, with an evaluation summary. I'll give you a couple more exa examples of the evaluation summary in a second. Um, uh, critically, um, uh, the if you um, if you don't end up um, being accepted into eLife the journal, uh, then um, uh, then you get control of when those uh, reviews are posted. Now, this is important uh, because um, whilst we're transitioning to this system and we're still making publication decisions, um, the uh, it, we think it's important that our reviews don't uh, punish you or, or, or stop you from publishing your uh, paper elsewhere. And so we're trying to be really careful. Again, a couple more uh, things, uh, um, sentences about that later. Next slide, Maria. Okay, so I just wanted to give you a couple of ideas about where th the kinds of things that might be written if you uh, about about your uh, papers online, uh, which just to give you an idea of what you might be able to put in your CV or put uh, or or uh, put in your grant application instead of 
a journal name in the future. And obviously, this is this kind of thing requires the granting agencies to be on board. But we're doing that kind of lobbying as well to try to make sure that's true. But this is this is this is um, one example. This study is of broad interest across a diverse range of neuroscientists studying sensory systems, reward guided behavior, and interregional interactions. It's a unique, dramatic, and important demonstration of the specific interactions. Blah blah blah. Very clear statement about what the contribution is rather than the journal name over here this study is a tour de force that makes a major contribution to the field it provides a massive amount of information about the connectivity in the drosophila so those kinds of evaluations we hope will will be succinct enough to go in your that reviewers will really read them unlike the papers reviewers of your grant applications don't read your papers but uh, contain enough information or more information um, about what we think about a paper than just a journal name. And it's a big push uh, to try to um, to change this attitude that you have to have a nature paper or you have to have a science paper uh, to get a um, to get into um, to get funding. Okay. And last slide, uh, this can be the last slide. Um, so uh, we think this is a this is and just to re repeat, we think this is how, why this is important because the authors control when your work is shared. The evaluation is divorced from the publication of science, and therefore we can make richer, more transparent evaluations. Um, and so the, the, this means the peer reviews are really written not to increase the impact factor of the journal because they're not gatekeeping anymore. The peer reviews are written to help the authors and the readers and the, and the other stakeholders, the granting agencies, the journalists, et cetera, et cetera, understand what the contribution of the paper is. And we I hope that means that peer review can be more constructive and more respectful. Great. Thanks. I think you've probably heard and you've understand it now. So um, in the last slide, I just wanted to, I was worried, I just wanted to make sure, just to move one more slide down, Maria. I just wanted to make sure that everybody understands that we are currently, we realize that right now, none of the key stakeholders that, 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 that understand what a, a, a reviewed preprint, a refereed preprint is. And so right now we're still gonna be making decisions about uh, that let you get into the journal. We're still publishing things in eLife right now. This we, we are, this is the future we're envisaging. And so at the moment we're running two different schemes. We're going to do everything I just told you about, give you your rich set of public reviews that you can use to get your new job. And we're also going to give you a published paper just like uh, eLife Mark 1. Um, uh, cool. Excellent. Thanks very much indeed. Um, uh, Maria, I think that that's all I have to say. Is that right? Yeah, um, thanks. Tim. I, I wonder if we should just invite Megan, Juan, and Flores to say a little bit more about what appeals to them under this new model as well, if they could share their experiences as editors and views and authors as well. Uh, Megan, would you like to start? And then we'll open up the, the Q&A after the editors have uh, spoken. Um, sure. I, I'll just say really one thing, which is that I think one of the things I like about eLive compared to other journals is has always been the kind of level of humanity that's embedded within the review process. So I think that the already the consultative nature of peer review was a big step in that direction. So people are you know having um, real conversations with real live people, which I think encourages good behavior in terms of. Um, honest and and constructive reviewing and discussion. And I think that is, in, in my experience handling papers since this public review system has started, I, I think this actually provides an extra boost to that kind of um, constructive nature of the reviews. And, and the reason for that is when people submit the reviews, not only do they know that their name is going to be associated and they're going to be discussing and sort of defending uh, their reviews with these other colleagues that they're reviewing with, but they know that these reviews are going to go on to, or some, some part of it is going to go on to borrow by archive, um, regardless of whether eLife ends up publishing a paper. So even for the most negative reviews, Reviews. I, I think that there is a tendency to be a little bit more um, constructive, and and I've even 
in at least one paper that I've handled, people have actually backed off on some of their um, harsher criticisms and said, you know, um, I, I don't really feel comfortable putting that out there and, and therefore I'm going to kind of take it back. And so I think it's everything that eLife has done to, to um, improve the constructive and positive nature of the reviewing. I think this is, this is one extra push in that direction. So that's my favorite aspect of it so far. Thanks, Juan. Yes, I completely agree with what Megan just said. Um, I mean, um, at the beginning when I know eLife, I was so intrigued by the, by the way they put the reviews uh, public. It seems like opened a black box uh, for the... So at that time I learned a lot from reading the reviews and know how reviews think uh, other papers and the whole process. Uh, and also, since I have been the reviewing editor, I really enjoy the consult consultation sessions because in the consultation session, it's not just a, you decide it. It's like you can hear a lot of different voices. And because it's public, I mean, public around, uh, uh, among these reviewing editors, you should be responsible for what you have said. Uh, as to the new uh, publication policy, uh, first of all, um, I mean, my lab, we always put our paper in preprints. So um, it's not very different, at least for my lab, but I know like uh, everybody might have their own different concerns. But um, the new policy also make the review think that they're all comments, no matter it's revision, uh, accepted or rejected, were put online. So everybody should be responsible for what they say. This is a good way uh, for us to communicate. Um, uh, I think since the, since the new publication policy, I have handled, I think, 45 papers. Uh, I remember one paper, we also need to uh, consult with a, with a reviewer that um, maybe the tone should change a little bit, like this thing. So yeah, I think um, we should learn, although a little bit slower. But that's how we communicate with each other and be respectful for others. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Juan. Flores? Yeah, I can uh, mostly just echo what Megan and Juan already said. I completely agree with what they're saying. Uh, for me, eLife is also, I think there's several aspects of eLife that I find very appealing. I think one of them is that it's run by scientists and there is a lot of emphasis on um, communication, so on like uh, reaching consensus. And the idea there is that it will uh, make the decision-making process more rigorous, but hopefully also less biased. For example, less biased towards topics that are trendy or labs that are famous. So in that sense, I really like uh, that aspect of it. Also, at when a paper is reviewed, uh, there is a dialogue between the reviewing uh, the reviewers and the editor. And uh, rather than just the editor sort of uh, making a decision based on sort of two lists or, or three lists of uh, reviews. And I think the, inno the innovative spirit of Eli, sort of the drive to change how the publishing industry works, is really uh, cool. And there, I also think the PRC model, so what Tim was just uh, describing, is uh, really interesting. I What I like about that is that it's uh, at, at the moment, there's a lot of thought that goes into the review process. And then it often just remains hidden from the scientific community forever because it's uh, so there's a lot of people that think about it and then they they, um, they write thoughtful reviews and then they become they remain hidden unless a paper is accepted. So I think the PRC model will make the knowledge available to the wider community. And as I think Megan and Juan were also saying, it will hopefully help to reshape the review process itself. So the idea is that it should become more constructive because when you know that your assessment will be read by the entire world rather than just the authors, that is going, you will likely put more effort into making your comments as helpful as possible. At least that's the, that's the idea. And I think, yeah, it's a wonderful idea and I hope that it's gonna work and indeed change publishing. Cool, maybe we should take some, thanks, thanks everybody. Uh, um, good, I agree with all those comments. Um, uh, maybe we should take some questions now, Maria? So so Adam, Adam um, Claridge Chang had a few questions. He has just raised his hand. Uh, hello, hi. Hi. Hi, uh, yeah, this is uh, Adam Claridge Chang. Uh, 
Yeah, so thanks for the, the great presentation and thanks for the excellent change in policy. I think this is a breath of fresh air um, to transform the way that uh, research is evaluated. I guess my question is that I, I'm a bit of a, of a peer review skeptic. <laughs> um, so there, there's a fair amount of evidence that, you know, you know that the evaluation doesn't catch errors, um, that it doesn't necessarily overall increase the quality of work. And I'm concerned that, you know, so, so Flores just mentioned that, you know, scientists should spend more time evaluating, more effort writing peer review. And I think there's an argument to be made that actually peer review could be something of a waste of time akin to the existing system that's in place. Uh, with peer review and this relentless evaluation with very little effort spent on replication. Um, and the funding bodies and the journals refuse to support replication studies um, uh, in, in the capacity to which I think they should. And I'm just wondering, I know eLife in the past has published replication studies, but I'm just wondering what the state of the policy is now with regard to replication studies, are they seen as second-class citizens the way that most scientists view them, or are they going to be elevated to something a little bit more noble uh, since they are the underpinning of, of, you know, what is scientific, right? <laughs> uh, I, does anybody want to that? I can take it if no one else. What, I'm happy either way. Uh, so, I mean, so I think that the, um, uh, the, the, uh, there's two ways to answer that question. The first is that eLife uh, has invested hugely in replication, whole entire replication projects where they have, where um, uh, we have uh, effectively been involved in the in the commissioning and organizing of entire replication projects and, and committed to publish the whole thing in cancer biology and in various other fields, not yet in neuroscience. Um, uh, but we are uh, totally on board with the fact that um, uh, replication is important, and we uh, um, have uh, um, we we have uh, uh, invested time, effort, and money in that uh, concept in the past, and still do. I um, then there's the general submission process to eLife, where um, my experience of it so. I, I don't think we have an explicit policy. Maybe we should. My experience of it is that e is that replications are treated much more seriously at eLife than at other journals, potentially because it's actually run by scientists. But I think that still it's the case that we will evaluate whether we think a replication study is of um, uh, substantive interest. Um, we have definitely published lots of failures to replicate. I think that we have uh, through the through the um, standard channels. Um, we ha we do publish simple replications through the standard channels, but I think mostly when it's controversial or um, uh, or when we think it's of particular interest to publish a replication uh, replication study. Uh, maybe we should have a. Um, uh, so one of the things that. I find most attractive about this new world is that um, we ne we no longer we we no longer are focusing on whether we publish something or not. And so I, I, I think that it will mean that editors are much freer to evaluate things or to re peer review things if they think that peer reviewing is it is valuable rather than publishing it is valuable if you see what i mean so I, I, and it will and it will allow us to be much clearer about why we think it's it's valuable so i i, I think that that we we will therefore for example we can say we can happily say this is an extremely valuable thing because it makes it adds robustness to the literature and divorce that from something that's extremely a valuable thing because it's a creative, interesting piece of uh, piece of theorizing, right? And both we can acknowledge that both things are totally valuable for totally different reasons, and we don't have to have this um, like Berkson's paradox, where 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 you end up with with either one thing or the other being good enough to get you into e life. If you see what I mean, Do, is that does that make clear? Uh, I wanted yeah. to. 
Can I follow up on that a little bit? Because there's also, I think, a related question here about the about the separation of whether it's suitable for eLife and um, the, the peer review process, because there's also a question here that asks about if there are way more preprints than eLife has capacity for, how will the preprints to review be selected? So I think it's important to remind people that there is still a phase of the process once you submit a paper to eLife where a group of editors actually assess the paper and decide whether or not to send it out for peer review. So that is still happening. It's not like we send every paper that comes to eLife out for peer review um, and, and then it goes through this public process. This public process is only for the papers that the eLife editors decide are um, going to go through that next stage of the process, just, just to clarify that for everybody. Did that answer your question? I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, yeah, that uh, that answers my question. I I, I guess um, I mean I don't I don't want to derail the conversation because I, I think that what you guys are doing is very important um, and it's definitely a step in the right direction. It's just um, I think that uh, you don't believe in peer review. So I, we it, well, I, I think yeah I think I, I think that question is one for a different day. We're, yeah, we're happy to exactly, agree with that question. exactly, but yeah. but I'm happy to hear that eLife is uh, very supportive of replication studies and it's on your mind. So. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. We also got a, a question from Junhan Chen uh, about uh, becoming an editor for eLife. So they said, good to learn that you're recruiting more Asia-based living editors. While I have published three papers with eLife, all very good experience, I never got a chance to review an eLife manuscript. How to, do I apply to serve as a reviewing editor? So currently the way of getting into being a reviewing editor is being uh, effectively suggested by existing reviewing uh, uh, editors or uh, it's been suggested by existing editors um, and um, then going through a process of, of us figuring out what we need in terms of um, covering, in terms of coverage. We are totally aware that that introduces um, nepotism and biases. And so we will, I think, be much more in the future doing open calls for reviewing editors. Um, and so you're likely to see those in, in neuroscience. Um, and they are likely to be, for a particular geographic, to, to resolve issues we have with geographical diversity, that kind of stuff. So, so I, I think that will be um, uh, true in the future. Um, if you uh, if you're particularly interested to help us now, then um, sure, send your CV to Maria and I. And um, um, I don't actually know what field you're in, but if you think there's a particular senior editor in your field that's um, that is relevant, then you could tell us their name as well and we can cons all consult. Thanks, Tim. Um, we have a, also a question from Horan Schuldiner. Um, so this is a question for the life leadership uh, about the distribution of the panel today in terms of um, scope of research. The vast majority here represented today in systems, behavioral and cognition neuroscientists. Uh, and uh, we don't have anyone representing the neurodevelopment side. So the question is whether this is a, an intentional decision or whether we are keen to diversify in terms of scope as well. Tim, would you like to comment on that? So it, it is partly true that, 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 so that, so that is partly true. It's not completely true. We, we have people with model organisms. We have two senior editors in, in, uh, in model organisms. We have also have, um, uh, so we have Piali and we have uh, Ron Calabresi, um, and we also have um, uh, we, we we also have uh, uh, neurodevelopment. Um, uh, Marianne Bronner ha uh, handles quite a lot of that, um, and um, uh, Huda Zogby handles uh, quite a lot of that. We're actually just recruiting another senior editor in that uh, in. Um, uh, we're actually just uh, going to be recruiting another senior editor as well. So, I, but I think you're right in your take that our um, that our scope is systems and disease more than development and model organisms. I think that's right, um, and it's definitely not a conscious decision. That's it's been done in response. It's been done in re response mode, and it's. Um, it's slightly ironic, given Eve's background, by the way, that, but, but, uh, who started the neuroscience at, at um, 
uh, at eLife. But, but, but yeah, so uh, the, the answer is we recruit more editors when we have pressure in particular areas and we have therefore uh, recruited more in areas where we've got more submissions and that is how it's happened. Um, and, and so uh, it may be a reflection of the size of those fields and it also may be a reflection of, the, of, the, of a sort of virtuous or vicious cycle, whichever way you want to look at it whereby if you have more editors in that field, you end up recruiting more papers in that field. And so maybe perhaps we could have a, it's, it's an interesting thought that I, haven't, that I haven't had. We could perhaps have a particular um, uh, pressure, uh, a particular push um, in some particular fields to try and equalize um, our, what, what we're doing. But I, but I don't think it's fair to say we, ha we don't have editors in those, in those domains, we, we definitely do. But I think you're right that we have more editors in systems and, and cognitive. Thank you, Tim. Um, we have a, a question from Danai Riga who says, uh, bioarchive support discussion comments from the general audience. Would you like reviews and editors take into account that discussion for a final decision on accepting slash curating a manuscript? Can you just read that again? Sorry, I was trying to find it while you were reading it. Sure. Uh, oh, you know, I've got, I've, got, I've, got I've got it. So, I mean, it, yeah, I, um, I guess um, maybe somebody else wants to, I, I, I guess it's a policy. Well, maybe else, somebody else wants to have a look at that. Or, well, I, 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 so so the, answer, the, the answer is not at the moment, but like we could and we might. Like we, there's, so many, there's so many things that we can do. Like, for example, we're talking about um, doing open calls for reviewers. So, so to, to have a, a page on the eLife website where we uh, announce what papers are under review because they're all on BioArchive anyway, so anybody can comment on them. And so we're, we're talking about those kinds of things. There are obvious risks, right? There are obvious risks that your mates might be writing those. Or um, uh, when we, and so it's hard for us to evaluate. And so all of these exciting new ideas that come with changing how peer review works uh, we're, are under consideration and we're open to trying these things. And we're aware that there are potential, we're in a whole new world. There are potential biases and risks and problems with all of them. And I think that, um, we'd have to be pretty careful about accepting general audience things because once the authors knew that, then their mates would start writing uh, comments on bioarchive for them. Um, and so there's there's tensions there, but we're but we're thinking about these issues. Yeah, just just to chip in here as well. So I, I would agree. So I think it's an interesting idea, but at the same time, I mean, what, what Tim suggests is could be could be happening, but also. Uh, the opposite could happen, right? That, that opponents or that people that have a different idea uh, would would start uh, writing their review. That would then take, be taken into account. So there is something to be said for like a careful selection of unbiased reviewers, with, uh, taking into account also the wishes of the authors there. And that I think is becoming harder when you would open it up to the entire world. But, but one thing to say, I think, is that we envisage in the future that we are just one. Uh, so we are just one of many people that would evaluate a manuscript rather than being the gatekeeper. We, have, we envisage a situation where, I don't know, if you've got an interesting medical problem that you're taking a, a new statistical technique to, then different people, like the Journal of Interesting Medical Problems might, might evaluate it, but also the Journal of Complicated Statistical Techniques might, might, might evaluate it. And different people should be responsible for, for saying this is an interesting medical problem versus this is a rigorous piece of statistics. Um, and so I, I think in the long term, once it's all, everything's open, I think that there needs to be a way of managing this 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 comp, this uh, the, the 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 combined set of complicated opinions about a manuscript um and um uh, and uh, and that can never be done in solely in a closed system by one body and so yeah we're building we're building these tools to help this evaluation this tool called society which is in its which is just in nascent form right now but but um uh, where, whereby we can combine evaluations from multiple different bodies um, about a single um, manuscript. 
Thank you, Tim. Um, we have an, another question from Robin uh, Einstein. Is there a risk that this model gives editors more influence? If the target model at eLife is not publishing a- anymore, then the selected for eLife review will be the prestige marker, which is now controlled by the editors alone without any review input. Although the reviews are public, the first order assessment by people with the time to read the paper or the reviews will still be with, with the journal. Maybe Juan, you want to take, or somebody apart from me should talk. <laughs> Megan, would you like to respond? Um, I can, unless Juan. No, no, you first. I, I, I still didn't get this question. Uh, okay. Well, uh, I, I think it's, it's adding, yeah. Okay, it's it's related to to the the previous question when I was highlighting the fact that there's still this uh, consultation among the reviewers of whether or not to send out papers for review, and I think um, I think it's a good point. I, I think that everything we've said about the transparency still needs to have a little bit of an asterisk because that stage is still an important part of the review process at eLife. But I think I would echo again what Tim was just saying, which is that eLife is making this move not just to change how eLife works, but ideally to change how publishing works in general. And so, you know, I think the hope is that eLife won't be the only journal doing this and this won't be the only um, gatekeeping step for getting your paper reviewed, you know, on, on bioarchive in this way. So um, hopefully that will minimize the problem. And, and I mean, at the end, I think as long as there's some sort of evaluation process, these things will always be issues. But um, I think the idea is hoping to move things in the right direction and just get things started rather than being the sole arbiter of um you know, certainly not the goal is is to create this extra layer of prestige. Although I think it's an interesting point whether selected for e life review will become a prestige marker. Um, let's hope not. <laughs> well, I think as Tim said, though, uh, we could also at some point choose to review papers, not because we think they're excellent, but because it's important to review them, right? So because they might be making sweeping statements that that are that might be completely unwarranted. So in that sense, my hope would be that uh, people will read a little bit more than just like this has been reviewed by Eli and also actually read what the review says, right? And then I think this problem will be mitigated to some extent because then if, if you read the review and it actually says, well, the, the claims in this paper are fully unwarranted, I don't think that will be a, a prestige marker. To, to, to my knowledge, we've done it twice so far in, a, in neuroscience papers. We've opted to review things because we were so angry about the bioarchive preprint that we wanted to make comments on it. But so um, so there, there, are two, there are two examples of that we've done, we've done so far. Juan, did you want to comment? All right. Yeah, so I think I also learned learn more from today's panel. Um, yeah, I agree. Think about you, you look at you watch some news or you watch some findings, and many people are feel free to make comments. And so the decision and the reviewers' comments are just a one one way to how to say to evaluate your work. So I, I totally agree that decision, whether it's accepted or rejection, it's not just a binary decision because you've got so many helpful and respectful or constructive um, comments from the scientists. So I think, uh, yeah, that, that's a way, like um, everybody, I mean, scientists in the world need to, how to say, learn this process and be, you know, accept this new way. Um, because in my personal opinion, I always think that eLife is quite brave to implement many, how to say, um, yeah, uh, like very new uh, new steps to try to change what people think about how their papers should be read by scientists, how their papers should be decided, and that's a, I think that's the main thing with eLife. So yes or no is not a, the, the final answer. I think the answer is like you, you have more fairness to know your paper and give you suggestions, and that one could be used as a label attached to your, to your work. So for me, I mean, in my personal experience, because I, I was also rejected by you life, <laughs> uh, I think I, I learned a lot from those, those comments. Yeah, that, that, yeah I, I just want to add a, a little bit. Thank you, Juan. We, we have a question from Catherine Hall that says, in the future model, when eLife as a publisher is defunct, would you envision any papers, uh, papers to be typeset or to just look like bioarchive articles with associated comments? 
Uh, so, um, BioArchive now is has is now XML or whatever. How I don't know. I, don't, I should know. So, uh, so um, w I, 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 I imagine uh, all sorts of um, automated uh, possibilities for for making BioArchive papers uh, look beautiful, which was not the case when they were PDFs, uh, are now available, and I imagine they're going to flood online over the next few years and i imagine bioarchive papers will start looking beautiful pretty quickly uh, that's what i imagine for um uh yeah exactly uh, i don't I, um that's that change is big i think um so bioarchive yeah. are doing that yeah there, and there are already templates out there right for even for making yeah. pdfs so so i i've received more than one submission to elife that's actually formatted already in elife's uh design template which is um a choice that the authors make already so yeah uh, so, Lei Zhang about uh, preprint, uh, about um, uh, 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 register reports. Um, so, uh, uh, we talk long and hard about pre registration and register, res, registered reports. Um, here's the thing a register report says this it says, Here's my plan. If I execute this plan, you, uh, you guarantee to publish it, uh, which is uh, admirable. Uh, Elife says this. We don't believe publishing is relevant, so <laughs> it's com <laughs> so it's complicated to know what we should do about register reports, which just asks us for the one thing we don't want to give, which is publishing. <laughs> um, and so, uh, but I think that actually, in this new world, um, uh, it's going to be fine, right? Because we can just give you a badge of, on your article. We, you can you can submit you can submit to OSF. And we can make a, a, a special badge, which says this was pre-registered, and that will then give you the ex. This is it's just one form of credit, in the same way that being interesting is another form of credit. And we're really happy. We'll be really happy to do that to to, to highlight you specifically because it's a better paper because it was pre-registered, and we'll definitely do that. In fact, we might even just borrow all the OSF badges and and work with them. I'm, I'm I mean, there's discussions about doing that. And so, uh, so, so that's really why, where I think we're going to go. I think adopting register reports for the eLife Journal part would be a real side step from what, what we think should happen in general to publishing, which I think, which is, which is, uh, which is, we don't think that there should be any gatekeeping in publishing. There should be gatekeeping in publishing. I understand there's a bit of hypocrisy there because there still is gatekeeping at eLife, but it's a weird message to be sending out. I think. Um, and so we're in two minds, but I guess what will happen is we will adopt all of the OSF badges and uh, allow you to, to highlight the fact that your study is pre-registered on OSF, uh, but we won't be having separate article types for, basically we, we don't want to have article types at all. We just want to have evaluation types. We want your article to be on BioArchive and we want to be evaluating it different. And if one of the cool things that's happened is you've pre-registered it, that's great. And we'll give you a badge saying this is this makes it a better paper. That's that's I think where we'll go with that. Um, Thank you, Tim. Um, so we're uh, two minutes at to time. So I, I suggest we can um, maybe start wrapping up. Tim, would you like to do the honors? Well, uh, so uh, hang on. Uh, was, that, was that addressed to me, Maria? Yes, I just wanted to, to ask you whether you would like to, to thank everyone for, for joining us. Yes, yes, I would. So thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to thank the um, attendees for coming, but and also thank the editors for their time in, in answering everybody's questions. So that's uh, really nice of you. And, um, uh, and we hope that you will um, embrace the new, um, the new philosophy and um, come and join us and try and publish at eLife. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you all for joining. Thanks for your time. Thanks. Bye-bye.